Tonight on Real to Real, travel with us to Camden, New Jersey, and meet the man they call War. Learn how he uses his artistic talents to wage his own war on drugs. The Vatican announced its latest appointments to the College of Cardinals, among them Philadelphia's Archbishop Anthony J. Bevilacqua. Discover what's in store for one of the church's newest cardinals. St. Monica's Church in Berwyn was recently destroyed by fire. Find out what you can do to help. All tonight on Real to Real. Hello, I'm Monsignor Charles Minov. And I'm Pat Shelton. Welcome back to Real to Real. How about that news? Archbishop Anthony Bevilacqua will soon become a cardinal. If I'm not mistaken, I think that makes the Diocese of Philadelphia the only diocese in the United States with two cardinals. It's pretty hard to reduce things, but we have to reduce things sometimes in short words. And powerful ideas like war, peace, love, drugs can always be done simply in street art. We are to meet a man, that's why we call him War. Matt, when I was about 12 or 13, I started selling reefer, and then it's progressed to the point where I started um, selling cocaine, and I started getting hooked on it real bad. And I just kept on, kept on, just doing drugs, hanging out with my friends, and that's all we did. You know, to have a good time, we just do drugs. I guess I was about 18, and that's when I started doing graffiti. And I was hanging on 4th Street, which is a, uh, a real bad drug corner. And a friend of mine just asked me to sell drugs for him. I don't even remember who it was, but uh, that's when I started selling. And after that, I just started doing the stuff that I had. I've seen a lot of my friends getting, getting locked up, you know, getting set up by their own friends. And right there and then I started thinking about that. Maybe this isn't for me. I didn't want to be like my friends. I didn't want to get locked up. The streets of Camden, New Jersey are definitely no place for children. Luis Melendez is one of many youths who became a product of his environment. In order to escape a life of crime, drugs, and possible death, Luis knew he had to make changes, major changes, if he wanted to survive. And so he turned to Jesus and found new strength in the Bible. And I just couldn't take it anymore, so I, I grabbed the book again, the Bible, and I started reading it, and I kept asking Jesus Christ to help me. I didn't, I didn't want to do it anymore. I didn't want to be in drugs anymore. And maybe a month or two after that, I, I met this girl named Ada, and it was this love at first sight for me. And slowly but surely, my life just turned around. I stopped doing drugs, I, I stopped smoking, I, I went to school, got my high school, I got my high school diploma, I got into college, made my first communion, I made confirmation, I mean, I, my life just turned around and it, and it was like that, it was real quick, but it felt so good. When I first met him, he was into drugs and he didn't really want to come to church and he just wanted to hang out. So once we started, you know, talking and talking, he started coming into the church a lot. Then he started, you know, starting believing in God more. Then that's when he got his GED and, you know, he wanted to influence me more and, you know, think. So he just started working out until he made him another and started getting closer to God. The story of meeting Lewis is, was interesting because um, he would come to church with his girlfriend who was very active in our youth group, but uh, he would always sit in the van. He would never get out of the van. He would never go into church. So I used to make it my duty every once in a while to go by the van and, you know, just wave to him or say hello to him or uh, try to strike up some kind of a conversation with him. And I think there was apprehension on the part of both. He was afraid of me and I was afraid of him. You know, this big priest is coming over to the van. What am I going to do and say, I have to face this drug dealer. What am I supposed to say, you know? It was one of those situations. But little by little, we got to know each other and began to trust each other. And uh, that's how I got to know uh, Louis. Lewis is really a fine person inside. He, he's a very soft-hearted person. He's a very good person, really. Um, his drug dealing was more or less the effect of the environment he lived in. But uh, he didn't have very much religious education. So when he first came to us, naturally, he was, he was full of questions. We had to answer all kinds of questions for him. And naturally, we sent him on a couple weekends to uh, enrich his knowledge of God and uh, he just picked it up from there. He did a lot of studying on his own, a lot of reading and uh, 
he was able to really become a good practicing Catholic. The Catholic Church filled the void which Luis Melendez felt within himself, and through its teachings, it educates individuals like Luis and many others. The tool that the Catholic Church is using right now is, is education. Uh, I, I don't think you could possibly go into any religious course today in any of the parochial schools or Catholic high schools without having some sort of a um, time dedicated to education when it comes to the drug scene. Being a drug dealer is without a doubt a monetarily rewarding endeavor. Fast cars, big money, stylish dress, and of course, many women all help to paint a glamorous picture of an easy life to the youth of today. Well, when I started making a lot of money selling drugs, it felt great. I mean, I had a lot of girls. I had, you know, all my friends were real close. We used to go out every Friday and Saturday night partying. I, there was no problems. I had money, I had a car. I felt secure. I wasn't thinking about the future. I was just thinking about the present. But mugshots, fingerprints, a jail cell, and prison doesn't seem so glamorous to Lewis. Fortunately for Lewis, escape was still possible. He got another chance and a start at another life. For now, Lewis Melendez is known on the streets of Camden as the warrior, a street artist who they call war. I picked war because a long time ago I was trying to succeed so bad that uh, I just picked the name war because that shows that I'm trying to struggle and I'm trying to battle everything that opposes me from trying to succeed. Today, War uses his unique form of graffiti art to condemn the world he once dignified, transforming his ideas into anti-drug slogans. I started changing my graffiti into positive messages because I seen how screwed up my life was because of drugs and because of violence. So I started doing, maybe by putting positive messages up, you know, in a way that the kids can relate to because graffiti is a street art. And a lot of the kids here can relate to it, and maybe that would encourage them to leave whatever bad things they're doing. Currently, Lewis is busy at work in a film which is a collaboration between the youth group of Our Lady of Fatima Church and the Camden Police Department. This film, which depicts the dark side of a life of dealing drugs, will, when it is completed, provide a dramatic picture of the danger zones that are an inevitable element of the drug world. The streets are no place for kids, but these aren't kids. They are mature and responsible adults, able to take care of any situation that they encounter. 15-year-old Jay Bradswell thought he had experienced it all. He never realized just how young he was and how much more there could have been. At 15, he will experience no more. Most of the, my friends that died, they died real young. They died 18, 19 years old. And stuff like that made me think that the drug game isn't really taking me anywhere. Drugs really screwed my life up. I'm 25 years old now, and I feel as though if I didn't have drugs in my life when I was younger, I probably could have been successful at what I want to do. Drugs, they're just nothing. They're, they're just there to destroy you. Um, I believe that Jesus Christ is the one who helped me. He turned my life around, and I thank him every day and every night. Conversion is not just from bad to better, although thank God it is, but it's also conversion from better to best. And for instance, the good, the good things that have happened to Archbishop Bevilacqua are a real means for all of us to come closer to God. In the early morning hours of May 29, 1991, the Vatican announced its decision to elevate the leader of Philadelphia's Roman Catholic Church to the rank of cardinal. Today at the weekly audience, his Holiness Pope John Paul II announced my name as one of several new cardinals to be created in a consistory on June 28th. Bevilacqua, who was appointed Archbishop of Philadelphia by Pope John Paul II in 1987, was among the 22 prelates selected by the Pope to fill the vacancies in the College of Cardinals. 
neither as a young boy hopeful of being a priest, nor at any time in my life would it enter into my dreams that someday I would be the Archbishop of Philadelphia and be invited by the Pope to become a member of the August College of Cardinals. I accept this new appointment from the Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, bowing in awe to the mystery of God's providence in which I have always placed my fullest trust. Born in Brooklyn, New York in 1923, Anthony Bevilacqua was ordained a priest for that diocese in 1949. During his 34 years of ministry to the people of New York, he served on the tribunal of the diocese and held many other offices, including vice chancellor, director of Catholic migration, and chancellor. In 1980, Bevilacqua was ordained auxiliary bishop of the Diocese of Brooklyn, and three years later appointed 10th bishop of Pittsburgh by Pope John Paul II. Bishop Bevilacqua served the Diocese really of Pittsburgh for four years before today. being named John Cardinal Kroll's successor as Archbishop of Philadelphia in 1987. This is a day of rejoicing, a day of great joy for the Church of Philadelphia. We are supremely grateful to the Holy Father for once again recognizing the high caliber of the priests, religious and laity of Philadelphia by honoring its chief shepherd, Archbishop Bevilacqua, and bestowing on him the title of Cardinal. It is a tribute to Cardinal Bevilacqua that he was selected and recognized for his work in shepherding the faithful of the archdiocese. On this day, we wish him many more days and many more years of life fruitful and joyful in every respect. During his short three-and-a-half-year term as archbishop to the country's seventh largest diocese, Bevilacqua has sought to strengthen and enrich the spiritual needs of over 1.3 million Catholics by instituting a diocesan-wide program of pastoral renewal. The awesome dignity of Cardinal is an eminent honor for the church in Philadelphia, but a profound responsibility for me. Conscious of my deficiencies, I am enlivened by the surety of God's mercy and the guarantee of his abiding presence. Under the protection of Mary, our Immaculate Mother, through the inspiration of Saints Peter and Paul, St. John Neumann, and Blessed Catherine Drexel, I shall with unwavering conviction continue to profess and proclaim the teachings of the Catholic faith to support the value of Catholic education for all young people, and to defend the rights of the unborn, the poor, the sick, the aging, and all who cry out for God's love in our society. In his new role as Cardinal, Archbishop Bevilacqua will occupy a position which has had long-standing importance in the history of the Church, but never more so as under the reign of the present pontiff. For since his election in 1978, Pope John Paul II has sought to increase the function of the members of the College of Cardinals, who other than being electors of future popes, also serve as advisors and consultants to the present pontiff. We'll have more good news coming up on Real to Real after these messages.
Lady, you just made my day. Go ahead, make someone's day with love. Dare to get to know someone with AIDS. It'll probably change your life. Few things are as devastating as a house fire, but pretty nearly as bad and hurtful as your home burning is a church home burning. On a bright and sunny Wednesday, May 22nd, St. Monica's Parish in Berwyn, Pennsylvania, suffered a devastating fire that gutted its 102-year-old church. In session at the time, just yards behind the church, sits the parish school with 200 students, grades K through 8. The fire started between somewhere between 11.10 and 11.15 a.m. My children were outside at gym. I walked into the office to check my mailbox, and there was a sister, the first grade sister was on the phone telling the fire company that there was a fire at the church. I immediately just went outside to get my kids. Sister then evacuated the building. We were in math class, and um, our principal came on the um, loudspeaker and said that, told us exactly what to do to exit and go to the yard. And, um, and then we smelled smoke and heard children screaming. And um, the children were the kindergartners who were um, over by the building and were the first people in the school who knew about it. Other than a minor injury to one of the firefighters, no one was hurt. The school suffered no damage, only the church and rectory. Interestingly enough, the church was in the early stages of a $1 million renovation. The basement must have been gutted, a new meeting rooms installed as well as new pews, a permanent baptistry, an extended sanctuary, air conditioning, new lighting, stained glass work, a new floor, confessionals repaired, and ironically, a sprinkler system. However, the first order of business was the roof, and it was the flame from a roofer's propane torch that accidentally sparked the fire. The fact that the church was old and made primarily of wood helped to spread the fire quickly. When I arrived, we had heavy fire and smoke showing on the east end of the, of the church. Upgraded it to three alarms right away. Fire was quickly traveled to the west end. This is basically what you have. The roof caved in. Uh, we were able to stop it before it got into the rectory. Church fires are unique because of the open cathedral ceilings. The fire has nothing to stop it from traveling from one end to another, and it has plenty of oxygen to supply it. Right, there's no divider. There's nothing in between. That's what creates a big headache for us. And to now for Father George Hagenbach the assistant pastor of Tom Gillen, and the over 1,000 families of St. Monica's Parish, the new headache is, what should be done next? Currently, Mass is being celebrated in the school auditorium, and many church-related activities are either postponed, canceled, or held elsewhere. There are plans to rebuild, but it will take time and money. Presently, a number of contributions have already been sent from both business and private sources. A special fund has now been established through the Commerce Bank of Pennsylvania. For anyone who would like to donate, you can send a check payable to the St. Monica's Rebuilding Fund. Please address your contribution to the Commerce Bank of Pennsylvania, 200 Lancaster Avenue, Devon, Pennsylvania, 19333. Or call Richard M. O'Donnell, Regional Vice President for the Commerce Bank, at area code 215-254-9963. Father Tom Gillen says many parishioners are hurt by the loss of their church, but have accepted the fact. He also mentions that there is no shortage of volunteers to help answer phones, salvage files, and help in a general cleanup. We learn here at St. Monica, it's a very spiritual parish. It's uh, not a building, it's not an address, it's people. People are alive with God. So they'll rebound from it. Please help. And won't you please stay tuned for more of Real to Real after these words. Son, I figured when you were old enough, I'd talk to you about drugs. I tell you, they're nothing but poison. I tell you to stay away from the garbage that pushes that junk. Only I never figured that I ought to be telling that to a 13-year-old. If you don't teach your kids to say no to drugs, 
It's as good as saying yes. Oh, I haven't seen this in years. Grandma, who's that? Is that great grandpa and grandma? Yes, it is. And that's Ellis Island. Your great grandparents worked very hard to get there. Why did they come here? Well, like many immigrants, they wanted to fulfill their beliefs and dreams. About God? About many things, especially God. Religious freedom. A message from your Catholic neighbors. We welcome your comments, suggestions, and donations and encourage you to write us at Real to Real, St. Charles Seminary, 1000 East Wynwood Road, Overbrook, PA, 19096, or call us during regular business hours at 668-9842. We've had all kinds of communication tonight. First of all, single words, now running, thanking, writing. All these show us how we can draw closer to God. You're going to love this story. Ed is 77. His wife, Dorothy, is 75. They took up running about 10 years ago, and they're outstripping youngins half their age. I started running on the beach, and I ran five miles the first day. I was surprised. And then I got into a race. And then I got into a lot of races, and finally I, I got into a long race, and I said, boy, there's two things I got to do. One is I got to get into a running club with a coach, teach me how to do this thing, and lose 25 pounds. When the pounds melted away, Ed began traveling to world competitions. That's when white Dorothy decided to pick up the pace of running. Three years later, there was so much yak, yak, yak about running, so I went down to the National Athletic Health Institute, and I had their complete checkup. Dr. McKenzie said, go ahead and run with my blessing. So I've been running ever since. Competing all over the world has brought the Stotzenbergs countless medals, which isn't surprising because they're in constant training. What we do is we warm up two miles, then we run 200 meters, 150 meters, 800 meters, and a lot of 400 meters. And that, that builds up your cardiovascular so you can run a mile fast. The Stotzenbergs became so famous for their running skills, a track was donated in their name. I was the chairman of, a, of a, an advisory board in Pepperdine. I said, well, let's have a project. So it turns out that Dorothy and I had the project, so we <laughs> paid for it. <laughs> we, and it's, a, it's a wonderful track, and as you can see, there's kids all over the place all day long. Running's wonderful. Not only is it good for you, it doesn't cost anything. Besides, who knows, out there on the track, you can meet somebody interesting. I'm Doris Winkler. Dear Jesus, I come to you today realizing how many ways I need more forgiveness in my life. Forgiveness towards others who have wounded me, just as you were so willing to forgive Peter his faults and failings, and would have forgiven Judas also if he had allowed you to but also, Lord, the ways that I need to forgive myself for the things that I have done wrong, the ways that I have failed you and failed others. I pray, dear Jesus, as I consider your forgiveness today, that I can bring into your most sacred heart all of those areas inside of myself that need your forgiving touch. And as you look into my eyes today, you tell me that I am loved, that I am forgiven, and that I am yours. And for this, I give you thanks. Amen. Do you think Jesus ever wrote a letter? Jesus was, by all accounts, a brilliant man, so we know he could write. But there's no record of his ever having written anything down except the time when he doodled in the dirt during the moments when he was trying to save Mary Magdalene from being stoned to death. But listen, if it turned out that Jesus did write something and we found it, imagine what a hallelujah that would raise. When lost manuscripts are found, they, they always reveal something of the people who wrote them. They provide a way for us to connect with those people, those people of the past. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in the caves at Qumran that used to house the Essene sect, and those scrolls were found in the late 40s and early 50s by archaeologists. Those 
Dead Sea Scrolls caused tremendous great excitement. Not only did they reveal the soul of the times when Jesus was physically walking the earth, but they evoked a whole history of Jewish life and theological ambiance. What a stupendous development it would be if we found scrolls written by Christ. But it won't happen. It won't happen because Jesus always avoided being pinned down to the present moment. That's why he spoke in parables. Because Jesus never belonged to one time or one place. What Jesus was about was forever. And what about forever was Jesus conveying? He was showing us that love is a whiff of forever. Nothing else in your life reveals forever except love. Every time you feel love for a spouse, a friend, a child, a stranger, a little bird, or an old dog, any time you feel love within yourself, you open up the scrolls of Jesus written in his blood. Any time you show love, you dip into forever. Twenty questions, Pat. Maybe not twenty questions. Do you remember Cardinal Doherty? No, sir. Great strong. When he was there, you knew the church was present. How about Cardinal Hara? Before my time. <laughs> <laughs> you might make him like an old fluky, but no, great strength. So I think Cardinal Hara was his, his personal piety and holiness. Not the other men were not, but this man was just evidence of holiness. But then Cardinal Crow, you knew. Oh, yes. yes what do you remember I, about him mostly, do you think? Well, I'd always heard he was... Uh, Tough, really tough. Uh -huh. But my personal experience with him was that uh, he was witty, is witty, and quite a kidder. Yes. You know? Yeah, now you can take say, Cardinal Doherty and Cardinal Hare and Cardinal Crow. We speak of tough, it isn't being tough. It must be a terrible responsibility to have that kind of uh, authority to use and care for people at the same time. Archbishop Bevilacqua has a whole different style. He goes out among the people more than we've ever seen a cardinal do, mm -hmm. has the opportunity, but that doesn't make him easier. No. It doesn't make his job any easier. No, it's a big, big job. You have too many areas, so many areas to cover. And the organizational opportunities he's using now, it's a whole different approach. So the Cardinal comes to us now, the Cardinal elect comes to us, giving us a new opportunity to see a church growing and moving. So let's move it together. Until I see you again, God bless you. And let's pray for it. Good night, everyone. Atlanta researchers have discovered a new surgical treatment that could prevent blindness in thousands of people with diabetes. Every cent counts. Praise the Lord. I'm Father Ralph Chifo from the Charismatic Office. Jesus assures us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And each week at a Charismatic prayer group, we experience through sharing, singing, and learning the joy of knowing the Lord with us. Become one of us and all of our brothers and sisters in prayer and the joy of learning about Christ's death and resurrection. Contact us at 668-HOPE.